Well, I want to start off our time together today with, with a fairly deep philosophical and theological question, which is this. All, at all of our campuses, raise your hand if you love pumpkin pie. Oh, yes, all over the place. Yeah, I love pumpkin pie. I can't tell you how much I love pumpkin pie. I am like a cat with catnip when it comes to pumpkin pie. I roll around on the ground like it's pretty amazing. I love pumpkin pie. What I didn't realize is that my daughter Gianna also loves pumpkin pie a lot. And here's how I found that out. Uh, when I, when I first, uh, about six years ago, when, I, when we sort of first purchased a house in Cottage Grove, it was, it was near Thanksgiving time. And so the realtor that, that sold us the house came by our house with the most hugest mega pumpkin pie that I had ever seen in my life. This is what heaven looks like to me. It's all pumpkin pie everywhere. So he brought this pumpkin, this mega pumpkin pie by. And so we took the mega pumpkin pie and we put it on the counter uh, near where my daughter was sitting at the time. Because that's where we leave her when we're just walking around the house on the counter. <laughs> Just kidding. Not true. Fake news. So like she was on the counter at the time. We put the pumpkin pie beside her and then we just kind of kept, kept the conversation going. And then as we were talking, I sort of looked over and I saw something that I will never soon forget. My daughter was eating the pumpkin pie, but she wasn't eating it like at a birthday party, you know, at a first birthday party where they're just grabbing and smashing it in their face and that sort of thing. She had a very deliberate technique of eating the pumpkin pie. It looked like this right here. Yeah, so this is sort of how she was consuming. And in our house, this, this is called the look away hand scoop technique. We, we have, we've taught this to her that if you want to eat pumpkin pie with your hands, you have to look away and grab it. And then once she would eat that, then she would put it in her mouth, grab it, put it in her mouth, and then she would sort of close her eyes from the enjoyment of the tasty pumpkin pie, but also because uh, what we also teach her is if, as you're eating, if you close your eyes, the calories don't count that as well. Yeah, that's, her mom taught her that. So, <clears throat> so anyway, I, I love that story of pumpkin pie because what, what I've learned over the years about kids, toddlers and a little bit older, is that they do this sort of thing. And it, this line of logic, this way of thinking makes sense to them. That, that whether they're playing peekaboo or whether they're pulling the covers up over their head or whether they're eating pumpkin pie with the look away hand scoop technique, if whatever they're doing, they believe, they believe that if they can't see something then it doesn't exist. It, the studies are being done right now about this. I looked them up the last couple of weeks. There's lots of research being done about why this is the case, but it is the case. And they think this way, that if they don't look at something, then whatever that is, is invisible or it sort of miraculously disappears. That they think that if they can't see it or if they don't look at it, then it doesn't exist. Toddlers are so foolish, right? I'm so glad that we as adults don't do anything like that. Oh, but we do, right? I mean, we do this sort of thing all the time. All the time. We tell ourselves things like, if we just sort of ignore the anger that we have that's like bubbling up below the surface in our psyche, if we just sort of ignore that anger, then it doesn't really exist. That, that if we just don't look at the bills, if we don't open the envelopes when they come in, or we don't, we don't check the balance on our bank account, then, then our financial situation, it doesn't, it doesn't actually exist. We say to ourselves, oh, if we could just avoid making eye contact with that person that we have conflict with, then, then, then they don't actually, they're, they're not there. The conflict doesn't exists. It's not real. If we could just cover up our isolation and our loneliness with an active online presence, then we don't have to admit what's really going on in our life or on the inside. If we could just refuse to admit that, that the addiction that we have is impacting the other areas in our life, if we just don't look at what's happening, then we don't have to admit that it's really there. That if we don't look at it, if we don't acknowledge it, we don't have to deal then with the actual 
problem. We could just look away. We could look away from it and just not think about it. We can pretend like it's not there. We can pretend like it's invisible, like it doesn't exist. But I think you know and I know that deep down we know that it really is there. In our hearts we know. You know. I know. We know the truth. We know what to do. We know. We really do know. But yet we don't do anything about it. We sort of live our lives averting our eyes and not looking at the true issue at hand. And so the question that I want to examine today is a very simple one, which is this. What happens if we never look? Like what happens if we never move our eyes toward the actual problem? What if we just keep our eyes closed for our entire lives and refuse to, to see the things we know we need to see, but we don't want to see? What happens if we go our, our whole lives and never acknowledge or never, never admit that we need to deal with certain things in our existence? What happens if we never look at what we know we need to see? What happens to us? Well, that's the question that I want us to answer today. And I think in order for us to accurately answer, we have to go back to Dan the Man's story. Now, if you're new with us, we've been in this series called Dan's Dilemma, where we've been looking at a Bible character named Daniel, who had a number of dilemmas in his life. And so we've been looking at lessons throughout this book in order to sort of educate us and inspire us and encourage us in our own journey to deal with our own dilemmas. And so we want to go back to that story today. So if you would grab your Bible, whether it's a, a, a fake Bible on your phone or a real Bible in in your lap. I'm just kidding. Just jo jokey, jokey. So totally kidding. So grab a Bible. If you're not normally a Bible grabber, grab one anyway and look at this text because I want you to see sort of the storyline. I want you to see how this story develops because what's interesting about this particular story today is that it's not really about Daniel. Like this book is about his journey, but this particular passage this particular chapter has another sort of main character, and we're going to look at him today. So Daniel chapter 5, the scene we're walking into isn't really a high point in Daniel's life or his career. It's not a high point for him. It's not a high point for the, the country that he's held captive in, which is called Babylon. And in this chapter, what we're going to see is that Nebuchadnezzar, who was sort of the, the king that made Daniel the prime minister at the time, this King Nebuchadnezzar, he's been dead for a number of years. And now there's another king that's taken over. And the new king's name is Belshazzar. And so when we see Belshazzar, the very first scene we see him in is not him as a king winning some sort of battle. It's not him as a king oh, uh, conquering some nation. We see Bel Belshazzar not as a, a king issuing edicts to his people. What we see Belshazzar doing in this very first scene is partying like a rock star. No joke. In fact, the, in the very first four verses, there's one word that gets repeated five times so that you can know what this party is really all about. So see if you can figure out what that repeated word is. So Daniel chapter 5 verse 1 starts like this. It says, Many years later, after King Nebuchadnezzar, King Belshazzar gave a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking the wine... He gave orders to bring in the gold and silver cups from his predecessor, that his predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. He wanted to drink from them with his nobles, his wives, and his concubines. So they brought these gold cups taken from the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines drank from them. While they drank from them, they praised their idols made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Anybody notice a theme here? <laughs> I, I'm assuming from the text that at this party there was a little bit of drinking going on. In fact, what's interesting is if you dig a little deeper into this particular text, what you find is that the writer of this is actually using restrained language to describe what's happening at this party. He's using sort of restrained language. He doesn't really want to say what's actually 
happening. But the writer makes it very clear that Belshazzar is giving free reign to any and every appetite that he has, that he wants to indulge in. And he's inviting everybody else around him to do the exact same thing. So what Belshazzar does in this moment is he takes, decides to take his de debauchery and his depravity to a whole nother level. And so in the midst of this, he remembers the goblets that the previous king, King Nebuchadnezzar, brought back many decades earlier when he captured Israel. Now, what's interesting about these goblets, these cups, is that they weren't ordinary cups. They were the most special cups for the Israelites, for the temple, because that's where they lived. These were the sacred cups of worship in the temple in Jerusalem. Now, you and I are like, well, big deal. What's, what's that about? I mean, who, it doesn't sound like that's that big a deal. So I, I wanted to sort of maybe create a scenario for all of us that would give us something comparable, that, that we could maybe see what Belshazzar was trying to say with drinking from these cups. And so this is what I think it would parallel to some degree for us today. It would be like if somebody broke into the church here and stole the communion trays from Crossroads in order to use them to hold jello shots at a party they were having so that everybody could get drunk and have sex with each other. Not exactly the same, but similar concept. And this wasn't done by accident or frivolously. To do something like this makes a very clear statement about what you think when you think about God. In fact, it makes a very clear statement about how little you think about God. To do something like this makes a very clear statement about how little you think about the things of God or the people of God. That you have no fear of God in your life. You see, for Belshazzar, this move was meant to be an intentional mocking of the God of Israel, which was Daniel's God. But in the midst of this moment of depravity and debauchery, something unexpected happens that causes the king to sober up in record time. <laughs> it's this rather dramatic intervention that takes place. Look at verse 5. Now, if you've never read this story uh, before this is going to sound sort of weird but just hang with it okay so verse 5 says suddenly in the midst of this party they saw the fingers of a human hand writing on the plaster wall of the king's palace near the lampstand the king himself saw the hand as it wrote verse 6 and his face turned pale with fright his knees knocked together in fear and his legs gave way beneath him <laughs> wow, right? What a crazy turn of events. I mean, here we have Belshazzar in the, in the midst, in the middle of mocking God and giving him the metaphorical middle finger when out of nowhere an actual finger shows up and begins to write some secret message in the plaster on the wall right in front of him. Now, I've read this story dozens and dozens of times growing up, and I've always wondered what this what this hand looked like. I mean, was it like a giant hand like those foam fingers that was like, ah, writing on the wall? Or was it like a, little, like a normal hand? What, was it sort of like a, a wispy ghost-like hand? Or maybe it was more like Thing from the Adams Family. I'm thinking it's more like Thing from the Adams Family myself. Whatever it looked like, though, I would imagine that Belshazzar's first impulse would have been to wonder if he had had a little too much Chardonnay in this moment and that he might need to switch to coffee <laughs> because these words are in front of him. Now he sees them and they're real and they terrify him. They terrify him because he doesn't understand what they mean. And what takes his terror to the, the next level is the fact that the message is not clear, and he can't interpret it. In fact, nobody at the party can interpret it. So then the queen, which is most likely Belshazzar's mom, because there ain't no party like a party where your mom's at, 
the queen speaks up because she remembers there's an old advisor that used to know this sort of thing from the former king. And so they send some peeps to track him down, and lo and behold, it's Daniel. Daniel's the old advisor. They, they wake him up. They get him up out of bed in the middle of the night, and they bring him to the party. And in this moment, Dan is forced to deal with yet another dilemma. Look at verse 13. So Daniel was brought in before the king. The king asked him. Now, keep this in mind, what he asks him. The king asks him, are you Daniel? Are you Daniel? One of the exiles brought from Judah by my predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, what Belshazzar just asked and said here is so critical to understanding what's happening here. Because if you were here for the beginning of the series or, or if you've ever read the beginning of the book of, of Daniel, what, what you get to see is that at the beginning of the book, Daniel is a young guy. He's a young man. And at this point in the story, this chapter 5 with Belshazzar, at this point, over 60 years has passed from the beginning of the story until now. So Daniel is now an old man. Older man. Let's say older man. He's moving very slowly these days. His hair and his beard are gray by now. And just so you know, and you need to know this, gray hair, according to the Bible, is not a sign of weakness. Because I see how some of you look at me now. <laughs> when you walk up to me after service and you're talking to me, and you're looking at this, and I'm like, my eyes are up here. My eyes are, why are you looking at this? In fact, I found this little gift in my office this week from the head usher of the last service. A little just for men. So I have uh, sent some Rogaine to his office this week. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Yeah. But that's where Daniel is now. I mean, he's an older guy now. He's probably in his 70s. He's probably maybe in his 80s even. And so as we think back over the trajectory of his life, we knew him when he was this young, strong Man, we saw him in the last couple of scenes in this book. We saw him as the right-hand man of the most powerful guy in the whole world. But now he's so thoroughly discarded that this present king, King Belshazzar, he doesn't even recognize him. Remember? He said, are you Daniel? Belshazzar doesn't even know he exists. I mean, how embarrassing, how humiliating for Daniel. I mean, this is the case, not because Daniel's lost his ability, not, not because his relationship with God or his purpose in this world has diminished, but because this king, this guy, he's a joke. He's a joke. I mean, as Daniel enters this room in this moment, one glance around the room, Daniel can tell just how little this king thinks about him and just how little he thinks about his God. Daniel, he, he enters the room and he sees the goblets and he knows immediately what they've been doing with them and where they came from. He knows what the king is saying in this moment. Because in this moment, Belshazzar has trashed Daniel's career. He's forgotten Daniel's people. He's mocked Daniel's God and now he has the nerve to ask Daniel to help him out and so he tries to bribe him he says if he can interpret the writing that's on the wall he's going to give him some expensive presents and a, and a pretty significant stipend and so the tension in this moment if you think from Daniel's perspective what to do the tension in this moment the temptation here is just to tell the king whatever he wants to hear so he can go back to bed he can get his payday and go on his way. But that's not what Daniel does. That's not who Daniel is. Daniel is unwilling to look the other way. Daniel is unwilling to close his eyes to the truth and pretend like everything is okay. So instead, he tells Belshazzar that he won't be able to buy his way out of this one. Look at verse 17. Daniel answered the king, 
Keep your gifts. Keep your gifts. I don't need that stuff. Or you can give them to somebody else. But I will tell you what the writing means, which is exactly what he does a few verses later. Look at verse 24. So God has, this is Daniel speaking. So God has sent this hand to write this message. This is the message that was written. Mine, mine, tekel parson. Clear enough for you? What? So he explains a little bit more. This is what these words mean. Mine means numbered. Because Belshazzar, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel means weighed. You've been weighed on the balances and have not measured up. Parson means divided. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Now that clears it up, right? I mean, this is pretty weird. What God wrote on this wall. And there are so many layers to each of these words. We don't have time to explore them all. I wish I could. But to summarize what God was telling Belshazzar in this moment, it's crystal clear. Belshazzar knows what it means. Daniel knows what it means. And what God is saying to him is simply this. You're doomed. You're done. It's finished. You're over. Not just your reign, but you are over. Because you're going to die. I mean, what an intense moment that Daniel is in the midst of, that Belshazzar is experiencing. And as I've read this over in preparation for this message, I kept coming to this point and stopping and thinking to myself, what a tragedy, what a tragedy. I mean, this is the king living the life that so many people want to live and, and a life without boundaries, a life without restrictions, an unfiltered life. Belshazzar is living that life and he dies in the midst of it. It sounds terrible. But the more I thought about it though, I thought this is actually an opportunity. What God did for Belshazzar in this moment, it isn't completely tragic. It's tragic in the sense that it's such a waste. But it's an opportunity in the sense that it doesn't have to be. Because what God did for Belshazzar is he told him a truth that applies to every single one of us. That you're going to die. You and I are going to die. Belshazzar died. That very night, Belshazzar, the king was killed. He died. And the handwriting on the wall that applied to him is the same handwriting on the wall that applies to us. That we're going to die as well. It may not be as swift, but we will inevitably die. In fact, USA Today reported that the newest stats just came in and they're completely shocking that one out of every one people eventually die. Shocking. What? I know. So the question is, this is the reality. What would you do if you were Belshazzar? Rather, what would you do differently if you were Belshazzar? In fact, here's the question of today. How would you live if all of a sudden you found out, just like Belshazzar did, that you had only a short time left on the earth. In other words, just like King B, if you knew you weren't guaranteed tomorrow, what would you start doing differently today? What would you do? If you only had a short time left on this planet, in Belshazzar's case, it was 24 hours. What would you do? What would you do differently today if you knew tomorrow wasn't guaranteed? You see, I think that's the, the lesson that we need to take from Belshazzar's life. And the reality is you probably, probably have more than 24 hours left to live. Even I at the 
seasoned age of 41 probably have more than one day. But the key word in all of that is probably. Probably. We probably, probably have more than one day left to live. But the truth is we really, we really don't know. Now I know this sort of all sounds very creepy and morbid, right? Honey, why did we come to church today? This is why we stopped coming to church when James is preaching. Winter is really getting to him. We should send him on a month-long Caribbean cruise to help him out. Yes, I agree. I agree. You can do that. But here's the deal. That wasn't my handwriting on the wall. I didn't create that scenario. That was God who said that. And I believe the reason that he wrote it on the wall for Belshazzar to read and for us to read today is because he knows something that we oftentimes forget or don't even know, which is this, that we can't really live, that we can't really become fully alive until we embrace our mortality. Not just acknowledge our mortality, but embrace the fact that we will one day die. Medical journalist Dr. Timothy Johnson says it this way. He says the meaning of life, the meaning of life. How many are looking for the meaning of life? The meaning of life is not pumpkin pie. <laughs> the meaning of life is that it stops. We will never figure out how we should live our life unless we fully understand the significance of the fact that it will end. So true. So whether our lives end in one day or one year or when we're 100 years old, it isn't the issue. The issue is that it will end. And because it will end and because it doesn't have a rewind button, we have to do the best we can to get it right the first time. So back to my question, what would you do differently if all of a sudden you found out that you only had a short time left on the earth? Because the truth is, that's it for everybody. It's always a short time. If you realize that, what issue would you want to start looking at then? in dealing with. If you realize you had a short time, what would you start doing differently today? What issues would you take your hands off of your eyes? What issue would you turn and look toward and begin to solve around you? If you knew you had a short time left, would you begin to deal with your drinking problem? And the fact that it's affecting everybody around you, everybody knows it. And the collateral damage that it causes is affecting the people you care about the most. If you knew you had a short time, would you start tackling that amount of debt that keeps getting larger and larger? It started off as a little hill, but now it's a mountain of debt. And it's something that your family and maybe even your kids are going to carry with them for the rest of their life. Would you start dealing with that? Would you get serious about addressing some sinful habit in your life? If you knew that you had such a short time left, would you start spending less time at work and spending more time with your spouse? If you knew you had a, a short time left on the earth, would you start spending less time on technology and start spending more time with your kids? Would you change your patterns in your parenting? Would you alter the way that you're dealing and interacting and engaging with your friends? If you knew you had a short time left, would you make that phone call and deal with that messy conflict? If you knew you had a short time left, would you forgive them? Or would you ask for their forgiveness? If you had just a short time left, what would you do differently than what you're doing right now 
Because the reality is, is that it's not an issue of time. It's not an issue of just waiting it out, hoping that it will resolve. In order to do this sort of thing, it requires intentionality. In closing, let me just share this story from an author that I, I really respect named Max Dupree. He's a leadership author, was a CEO of a company. And uh, he told this story about his dad. Um, his dad, uh, when he was uh, about 100 years old, he was 98 at the time, and he broke his leg and required surgery. Um, and as far as Max knew about his dad, this was the first time he had, his dad had ever been to the hospital. 98 years old. And so his dad had the surgery um, for his, his broken leg. And he was in the hospital. A couple days later, Max gets a call. Um, and they told him that his dad was sitting in a chair. And he wouldn't get in the bed. There, there were four nurses around him trying to convince him to do that. And the nurses told Max on the phone, your dad won't get in the bed. He's exhausted. He needs to sleep. But he won't leave his chair. So Max gets in his car, he drives to the hospital, and he sees his dad, who's still in the chair, and he says, Dad, how, how you doing? How you doing? And his dad said, I'm tired. I'm so, I'm so tired. 98 years old after, after surgery. And he said to him, how, how long have you been sitting in this chair? His dad said, a couple hours. The nurse, nurses are telling me that you won't go in the bed. Well, why won't you get in the bed? He's like, yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm not going in the bed. Why not? And Max's dad said this, the minute that I get in that bed, I'm going to die. Well, then Max said, there's no hurry here, Dad. Let's just sit and talk a while. <laughs> and that's what they did. They talked a while. And so after a while, Max tried again. Now what do you think, Dad? You ready to go to bed? You want to get in the bed? He said, no, no. If I get in that bed, I am going to die. Four times throughout their conversation, he tried to get him back in the bed. And, and finally, Max exasperated with this conversation. He said, Dad, you've told me for years, for years, that you're ready to die. What's different? Why won't you get in the bed? And Max's dad said, yeah, sure. I, I told you that. I told you that I'm ready to die. And I'm ready to die. Just not today. I'm ready, just not today. You see, to me, that story is so telling because what it tells me is that getting ready is not an issue of time. We're never ready unless we prepare to be ready. And so my, my question to you is, are you ready? Are you ready? Or is there unfinished business that you still need to attend to? Is there still a relationship that's out of whack? Is there still a situation that needs some attention? Is there an email that needs to be sent by you? Is there a phone call that needs to be made by you? Is there a house that you need to stop by? Is there a person you need to schedule coffee with to have a conversation? Is there somebody that you need to say something to? Is there somebody that you need to say, I love you too? Or I forgive you? Or will you forgive me? Is there business that hasn't been resolved in your life? Because if there's business unresolved, then you're not ready. And you won't be ready until it is. But you can be ready. If you have the courage to do what Belshazzar didn't have the courage to do. Which was to make a change. You see the fear I think for many people at the end is that we have regrets. But that's a choice. You don't have to end with regrets. You don't have to end with the conflict. You don't have to end with the problem still existing. You don't have to live 
with those words left unsaid, you can solve that today. The question isn't, can you? The question is, will you? Will you do what Belshazzar had the opportunity to do, but never did? That's our lesson from this week, from Belshazzar. Next week is even better. In fact, next week, Phil's going to be sharing with us probably the most famous story in all of Daniel. Daniel and the lion's den. It's an awesome story unless you're scared of lions. <laughs> then you're going to be terrified. But I've read the message, and what's amazing about the message is that if you have a friend who is asking, Why God? Why me? Why am I in this situation? Why does this exist? Then you're going to want to invite them back to hear it. That's an opportunity as well. So let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this story. We thank you so much for the life of Daniel. We thank you so much for his character and consistency in his life. That even when things were tough and situations weren't ideal, he was not afraid to look at reality for what it was and to speak truth into it. We thank you for his story, but we also thank you for Belshazzar's story. This king who didn't have a clue, who missed the opportunity of a lifetime. God, I pray that we learn from Daniel's good example, but I also pray that we take away the lesson from Belshazzar as well. That we seize the opportunities of our life, knowing that it will one day end but it's not over yet and we can resolve to do what we know we need to do now. Give us the courage to do that. And God, we thank you for Jesus who gave us an example of what that looks like in our life. And it's in his wonderful name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.